Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Catherine Bohr. As chair of the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine Committee on Enhancing Coordination Between Land Grant Colleges and Universities, I would like to welcome everyone to today's virtual workshop session entitled Building and Sustaining a Culture of Collaboration Across the Land Grant System. If you were able to join us at yesterday's workshop, you heard about two exciting collaborations built on the use of data science and artificial intelligence, offering novel and compelling platforms for bringing all kinds of institutions together and for tackling complex problems that benefit from having multiple partners. Today, we will hear about four different partnerships as described by pairs of individuals involved in those collaborations. We have asked them for short eight minute presentations to tell us about the goals of their activities, what it took to build these collaborations and to describe the keys to sustaining them over time. Today's workshop discussions will be moderated by a member of our study committee, Dr. Wendy Powers. Dr. Powers is Associate Vice President of Agriculture and Natural Resources at the University of California. There are also several other members of the study committee joining us online today. And in the interest of time, rather than have them introduce themselves, I'm going to ask the study staff to put up a slide with a list of the members so that public audience can see who is on the committee. Yesterday's and today's virtual workshops are intended to inform the final report of the committee, which will be released in September. We are also in the process of organizing one final working session on the topic of capacity and we hope to announce the date and the time for that session soon. The committee's report will make recommendations on how to encourage collaborations across the land grant system. And these are collaborations that will be successful and impactful. So we are looking forward to insights, insights from today's discussion that will help inform those recommendations. Before we begin, I wanna let you know that the meeting is being recorded and the recording will be posted on the project website about a week after this meeting. During the question and answer period, I'd like to ask everyone online to be mindful of the fact that the committee has made no conclusions about anything yet. Please don't leave our workshop today thinking otherwise. Comments made by members of the committee should not be interpreted as positions of the committee and in addition, please recognize that committee members very typically ask probing questions in these information gathering sessions, and those questions may not be indicative of their personal views. I would also like to note that there is a Q&A box that the public can use to ask questions of today's speakers, and we will aim to get some of those questions answered as time permits today. And so with all of this, I now would like to turn the meeting over to Dr. Powers for her introductory remarks. Thank you, Catherine. And thanks so much everyone for taking time to join us this afternoon. It is really my pleasure to have been part of this group, uh, the Blue Ribbon Panel, and to be here with you today talking to these groups about their collaborations. As the Blue Ribbon Panel undertook its work, it was clear early on that there are numbers of really strong collaborations in projects across the land grant system, projects that span institutions, projects that span transdisciplinary teams, and that these projects uh, have amazing outcomes from the efforts of the work. We also recognized early on that in addition to projects, there were people that we spoke with that really conveyed collaborations that transcended projects that really reflected a culture of collaboration across institutions. And so we're very fortunate today to have with us a number of these participants that we spoke with during our interview phase of the, pro of the Blue Ribbon panel work and have them share with you, as Catherine indicated, 
some of the things that have been done within these cultural efforts to sustain the collaborations, some of the challenges that have been overcome in doing so, and really help us all think more broadly about collaboration so that it's beyond the project, it transcends that project and does become part of the culture of how we all work in the land grant system. So we have four different projects, four different groups that are gonna talk with you today about their efforts, vastly different in the way they've approached their work and what their work is. And as Catherine shared, we've asked each of these teams to talk with you briefly about the work, the goals of the work, the challenges they've had in sustaining that collaboration and tips for all of us so that we can embrace these types of long-term collaborations ourselves. The first team is the first team is coming to us from Michigan and they represent the Michigan Intertribal Land Grant System or MILES project. We have two members of the team that are meeting with us today. The first is Dr. Steve Yanni. Steve is actually a member of the Blue Ribbon Panel, and he serves as the land grant director for Bay Mills Community College, a tribally controlled college located in Upper Michigan. Joining him is Emily Proctor, and Emily is the tribal extension educator, community food in the Community Food and Environment Institute in Michigan State University Extension. She works with Michigan tribal nations, tribal communities, schools, community partners, and other various uh, government agencies. Emily is a citizen of the Little Traverse Bay Band of Potawa Indians, and she also serves as uh, a member of the Miles Project, serving as the associate director of that project. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Steve and Emily to share some of their great ideas. Uh, Ani. Odeem and Queen Dijnekas, Megizi and Dodam, Waganaxing Odawa, Harbor Springs and Donjaba. Um, my name is Emily Proctor, Strawberry Woman in Anishinaabe Moen. I come from the place or land of the Crooked Tree, live in Harbor Springs, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you this afternoon. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Steve, as was mentioned earlier, from Bay Mills Community College, where I have the uh, privilege of serving as the land grant director. We are located in eastern Upper Michigan, right along the shores of Lake Superior. And again, I'm privileged to be a member of the Blue Ribbon Panel, working on this issue over the past number of months. All right. So what you see before you is a one particular slide that shares different logos from each of our tribal nations. Uh, need to give the caveat that these are the uh, logos, emblems, seal of our tribal nations here in Michigan. So if you are interested in uh, learning more, utilizing their logo, please seek their, their permission before using them. Uh, for this particular presentation, we are sharing them as a point of uh, education and awareness building. So that's our disclaimer before we uh, jump in. You'll also notice within this particular side that you see a fire. In Anishinaabe Moen, it is skode, skode, which means fire. And for Miles and the work that Steve, myself, and our wonderful partners, we think of our work as an opportunity to unify. The fire unifies us. It is deliberation, collaboration, ceremony, and sacred. You may see when working with tribes such items, everything has a purpose. The circle, everything in the circle is equal. Everything has a place. Though it can change with size, though it can change with those who are at the circle, we always remember those who may not necessarily be with us that day, but there is always space. Michigan Anishinaabe share common cultural practices and language called Anishinaabe Moen. All tribal nations share common ties to the land. The tribes have their own unique structure of government as well as political identities that vary from village to village, nation to nation. Seated around the fire that you see on the, the slide in front of you, in, our, in Michigan, we are the land grant system is represented by uh, four institutions, one of them being Michigan State University as the 1862 institution here in Michigan. 
The other three land grant institutions we have in Michigan are tribal colleges, uh, 1994 land grant institutions. They include Keweenaw Bay Ojibwe Community College located in the Western Upper Peninsula of Michigan, uh, Saginaw Chippewa Tribal College located in Central Michigan, about one hour north of Michigan State University, and Bay Mills Community College, the institution where, where I'm located, located here in Eastern Upper Michigan. The, this, this, the, the image that you see represents not only the land grant institutions, but also the tribal nations that we work with very closely as Emily mentioned. We have 12 tribal nations in Michigan, uh, but we only have three tribal colleges in Michigan, meaning that the majority of the tribal nations in Michigan do not have a tribal college or a 1994 institution within their reservation or within their tribal nation boundaries. Uh, so we, we have uh, all representatives, representatives of the land grant uh, system, as well as our tribal nation partners represented around the fire uh, that uh, Emily explained to you earlier. As you can also tell, as we spoke about, this is a circle. We strive to build in sustainability. Thus, the integrated Michigan land grant team to increase and improve the impact of extension, education, and research activities in partnership, that ongoing partnership with tribal nations, tribal communities, and their neighbors. And we'll continue to train and develop Native American, Anishinaabe, Indigenous talent to be employed in the land grant system. We continue to build our competence as a team to bring our authentic selves to our work to be accountable and reliable to, our, to others and to ourselves. We strive to ensure we are doing all we can to be transparent in all aspects of this initiative. We continuously strive to approach this work with humility. There are multiple ways of knowing and ways to engage with tribal nations. We must be willing and able to become comfortable within a less defined fluid environment, thus the Michigan land grant fire which equals the land grant family, and in my homelands, the Michigan Intertribal Land Grant Extension System. We continue to prioritize relationships, flexibility, and being open to new ideas. As the MILES team, we continue to build our structure upon community feedback, thus the close relationships being developed between the land grant system and our tribal nations. Sustainability is built into our framework, we're not project-based, we're not grant-based, rather we're trying to build a foundation or a system that will create a sustainable uh, working relationship between the land-grant system in Michigan and the tribal nations within the state of Michigan. We have some voices that we wanted to share with you that reflect some of the, uh, some of the uh, successes and some of the future aspirations regarding the work that we're doing with our MILES team, as well as some of the history of perhaps where we got to where we are today. Uh, the, so I'm going to ask uh, Emily now to, to share the first uh, the voice that we wanted to share with you. Sure. We just want to be at the table from one of our Michigan tribal leaders. Another quote comes from a, a previous president from Bay Mills Community College after Numbers, numerous years of exploring relationships and opportunities to work together. The quote is, I guess Michigan State University is serious about this now. This was after they put money on the table to support the work that we're doing collaboratively. And from Patrick Cudney, our former associate director from MSU Extension, who is now in a different position, supporting our campus and our community partners and tribal nations. Why are we doing this? Because we can and should. Tribal nations and colleges have a right to be there. We assist them with providing those resources and programs based on their needs. Miles will continue regardless of additional external funding. The next quote comes from my friend and colleague, Emily Proctor, Tribal Extension Educator at Michigan State University Extension. And her quote is, all of us are in relationship. We need to find a way to be in an equitable relationship with tribal nations, uphold tribal sovereignty by upholding tribal knowledge, traditions, values, and self-governance. 
And our final quote is from President Sherman of Kiwana Bay Ojibwe Community College. And this came uh, by way of communication of her staff that we partner with at our retreat. This partnership has strengthened relationships and increased collaboration opportunities between KBOCC and other Michigan land grant institutions. And with that, um, Steve, is there anything else at this moment for our presentation? Just, just the, the, the focus on the notion that this is not project-based, this is not grant-based. Our expectation is that the land-grant system will be part of the fabric of our tribal nation communities and uh, will therefore eliminate the, the, the episodic, the periodic relationships that have been developed uh, over the years, which sometimes have worked very well and other times have not. Uh, the outcome here is not projects. The outcome here is not um, uh, grants being pursued. The outcome is a foundation that allows these relationships to flourish into the future, regardless of who might be working at the inst individual institutions. And with that, Wendy, I think we've concluded our short presentation. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, Steve. That was really wonderful. And thanks so much for sharing the graphic. I love that. It really conveys that this is a long-term commitment to the partnership. So we're going to hear more from Steve and Emily a little bit later on. But next, we're going to go to our next example. Our next example comes from the 1890s Center of Excellence. And we have two presenters here presenting as a pair. Uh, the first is Alton Thompson. Alton is the executive director for the Association of 1890 Research Directors. And in that role, Alton provides leadership and coordination in representing the association and their interests in developing multi-state and national priorities and implementing a regional response for the 1890 system. Alton is joined today by Moses Cairo and Moses, I'll point out, is a member of the Blue Ribbon Panel. In addition, Moses is the professor, dean, and director of the land grant programs in the School of Agricultural and Natural Sciences at the University of Maryland Eastern Shore. Prior to that, he was a professor and director of Center of Excellence in Biological Control at Florida A&M. So Moses and Alton, uh, we look forward to your comments. Again, my name is Alton Thompson. I am the, uh, as Wendy said, executive director of the Association of 1890 Research Directors. And my colleague, uh, Moses Cairo, will be doing a couple of the slides for us. But this is about the Centers of Excellence uh, example, example, example of collaboration across the uh, 1890 land grant universities. Also, I must say I did enjoy the uh, presentation by on the 1994s, which are which are our partners in the uh, land grant system. In terms of why the uh, 1890 centers of excellence, the, the centers of excellence started really in 2015, with the celebrate in 2015 the 1890s celebrated 125 years uh, since the signing of the Second Moral Act of 1890. Essentially what the land grant university wanted to do was they appealed to the Secretary of Agriculture at that time, which was Tom Vilsack, to, com to com commemorate the occasion by establishing the Centers of Excellence to collaborate with USDA on its priorities and, and also on its programs. The secretary, however, did uh, agree to, to provide centers of excellence, but it did not uh, provide a secure uh, funding base. So essentially what he, what he did was ask the agencies to uh, use their discretionary funds to fund these centers of excellence. And this met with uh, mixed success. You know, some of the agencies used this, the discretionary funds. Some of the agencies did not use the discretionary funds. So it wasn't a, a good... So it really didn't uh, really materialize until the 2018 Farm Bill when they established the Centers of Excellence. The mission and the purpose of these Centers of Excellence was to foster and coordinate research, extension, and education programs consistent with USDA and NIFA priorities and programs. There are, there are 19, 1890s, and 18 Southern and border states. As I tell people a lot of the times, I have uh, 19 bosses, 
but they they are in 18 other states, which is good. And Moses Cairo is one of my bosses, so I can't say too much about my bosses. It was to create a culture of working together, a culture of collaboration, and also to, as sort of Steve mentioned as well, is to put a focus on populations that tend to be low income, marginalized uh, uh, persons who can really benefit substantially from USDA programs and who really also understands the culture of people that are underserved, underserved, or not served at all. It was also to leverage investments and we're looking at partnership outside of USDA, the private sector of other federal agencies to, to uh, leverage the commitment to uh, uh, USDA. And also the one thing that uh, was nice about this program was that there was no matching funds. One of the, one of the barriers that prevents the 1890s and the 1994s from participating in programs is the, is the requirement for matching funds. We don't have a non-federal match uh, to, to go with the, the program. So that's one of the barriers. So in that 1990 sense of excellent, this was this was an excellent uh, uh, alternative. To, there was an excellent uh, pr provision in the program to allow for non-matching funds. In terms of the how, this is where uh, Dr. Cairo would talk about the how in this presentation. Well, thank you. Thank you, Alton. So, so over the last seven to eight years, the key stakeholders from across the 1890 family engaged in a consultative process involving faculty, deans, research and extension directors, and presidents of the uh, 1890 institutions. The meaningful engagements were driven through existing structures such as the Association of 1890 Research Directors, the Association of 1890 Extension Administrators, and the Council of Deans. And these structures were essential in supporting that engagement across the universities. Through the consultative process, um, critical uh, national issues where the 1890s have a competitive edge were identified and prioritized for development as centers of excellence. These were also areas where uh, linkages with uh, clear linkages with stakeholders could be uh, drawn. A critical consideration was the need to ensure that each participating university had a voice and that the processes were inclusive and equitable. Shared ownership and governance were critical considerations along the process in the development of all the administrative and operational structures. While the specific details do vary from one center to the other, certain elements are common. For example, each has an advisory committee. But the bottom line is that all members have a platform to participate in the development of the work plans and also in the center ad administration. Back in 2015, the universities also recognized the utility of having an entity that would facilitate navigation across the participating um, institutions without being encumbered by the individual institutional bureaucracies. So to this end, the universities established the 1890 Universities Foundation, which supports advocacy, certain center operational processes. The foundation has just celebrated five years of operation and continues to support the centers. Alton. Thank you. In terms of the, also, thank you, Moses. In terms of the centers of excellence, these currently, of the 1890s have uh, six centers of excellence. Uh, again, th these were these were generated by the the, the uh, 2018 Farm Bill, and also we asked them for reauthorization in the 2023 Farm Bill. The first one you see here is the Center of Excellence for Student Success and Workforce Development. Uh, this is a center again tied to a USDA priority about workforce development. Workforce development is a very important topic now, uh, and also it is it was it's hosted by North Carolina A and T. And they have about eight partners that's working in this uh, uh, partnership, and it's excellent. One thing, as uh, Moses said, is the opportunity for collaboration. In order to uh, compete for a center, we specified that a consortium, each one of these centers, must have at least three participating institutions to work in these centers. And all of them have at least three, and some four, and some even, one even have uh, 18. 
The Centers for Farming Systems, Rural Prosperity and Economic Sustainability is hosted by Tuskegee University. All 19 universities take, uh, are participating in this center, small farm center hosted at Tuskegee. The next one is the Center of Excellence for Global Food Security and Defense. That, that center is hosted by the University of Maryland Eastern Shore and is guided by the very capable Moses T. Cairo, who's a member of, of this panel. Uh, the Center of Excellence for Nutrition, Health, Wellness, and, and Quality of Life is hosted by Southern University. Uh, again, you know, this center is very timely because primarily because of COVID. The COVID has really unveiled a lot of health disparities and quality of life issues uh, on the, in, the, in the population that we serve. And the two newest centers that was funding that was funding was appropriated last year was Emerging Technologies, which is hosted by Delaware State University, and Natural Resources, Environment, and Energy and Environment, which is hosted by uh, uh, Tennessee State University. So you see in the middle, we have the 89 Universities Foundation. Uh, the universities, universities, 89 Universities Foundation was is the management entity uh, for the Centers of Excellence. This was approved by USDA prior to forming these centers. This management entity was approved by NIFA USDA. Essentially, every uh, center have a RFA such that uh, their, their requests for proposals are sent out to all 19 schools. So even though you're not a member of the consortium, you're still eligible to participate in each of the center through the RFA program. Again, you know, it's the evolution of the centers. Uh, now we have six and we're currently requesting some additional ones in the 2023 Farm Bill. Sustainability is an important issue. Again, as Moses mentioned, our enabling policy framework is the Farm Bill, both the 2018 Farm Bill and the hope and preferably the 2023 Farm Bill, uh, section 7213. It's, about, it's all about making a difference. It's all about outcomes. It's all about impacts. Uh, also in order to be very impactful and very intentional in what we do, it's all about partnerships. Partnerships is a must. The 1890s, one 1890 cannot do it alone. Our consortium 1890s can't do it alone. So, we look, so we're looking at partnerships in everything that we do. Uh, the, the partnering facilitates a collaborative approach that allows the 1890s to develop a critical mass of expertise. Essentially, uh, right now we don't have the bench strength to allow us to amass a critical a mass of expertise this is about lessons learned. It's about best practices. It's about promising strategies that all contribute to USDA innovation agenda, as well as to 1890 innovation agenda. And also it's about contributing to the grand challenges in food and agriculture and improve the quality of life in the people that we serve and beyond. We're in an era of accountability and an era of impact. So again, it's, out, it's outcomes driven. It's about impacts and it's about outcomes. Global engagement, we do have the opportunity to engage globally. As you know, we're in a global-based uh, society, a technology-driven society, and the centers may collaborate with international partners. So we, we, are, we are allowed to uh, communicate or uh, collaborate with international partners that include subcontracts, and particularly the, uh, the uh, Center of Excellence that's hosted by the University of Maryland Eastern Shore in order to talk about global security. It's really imperative that we have international partners. The future takeaways, it takes effort, willingness to build working collaborative partnerships. It's not about a flavor of the month, as uh, Steve alluded to, it's about sustained partnerships, uh, including the not, including but not limited to the 1862 land grants, the 1994 land grants, industry, nonprofits, and federal and state agencies. It's all about inclusiveness and equity as, as the 1994 presentation alluded to as well. Our suggested recommendations to Congress uh, from this panel, if you want, would like you to consider reauthorization of the Centers of Excellence in the 2023 Farm Bill, increase the number of centers from six centers to 12 centers, and also increase the level of funding uh, to 5 million per center per year. Currently, the, the, the existing Centers of Excellence Funding range between 1.5 million and 2 million. That's really is not enough funds to have a real quote excellent center. So we want to increase the level of funding from 5 million per year per center per year 
also increase the sentence from six to 12 and also reauthorize the sentence of extra. This is one of my favorite slides. I like this little guy. Questions and comments. We can do it now, we can do it later. Uh, we, with, with, I yield to, to, the, uh, to Wendy Powers. <laughs> thanks Alton, thanks Moses. Great presentation and thanks for sharing the information on the centers of excellence. Uh, really a great way to build capacity within the 1890 system and uh, enhance collaborations with A2 and 1994s as well. We're going to just hold on questions for a little bit. I want to get through our next two examples, and then we'll come back. We're doing really well on time. Our next example uh, comes from Virginia, and it really illustrates uh, the path to building a sustainable long-term collaboration between an 1862 and an 1890 institution. So sharing with us some of their tips and uh, uh, successes is Dr. Ed Jones, Ed is the director or the emeritus director of the Virginia Cooperative Extension and associate dean of the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences. Ed started in that role back in 2011 and he just retired recently. So congratulations on that, Ed. Uh, hope you. you're enjoying retirement, although I've already had a conversation with him today and I know he's very busy. Joining Ed uh, today is Janine Parker Woods. Janine is the Associate Administrator for Virginia Cooperative Extension and Programming at the Virginia State University. She's also, she provides oversight to extension specialists and serves as the liaison between Cooperative Extension at Virginia State University and Virginia Tech. So I'm gonna turn it over to Ed and Janine and we really look forward to your comments. Thank you, Wendy, and we're glad to be with you today and, and share about our relationship in Virginia Cooperative Extension between two great land-grant universities, Virginia Tech and Virginia State University. Got um, that right. <laughs> the, uh, the leadership of the Commonwealth of Virginia expects our two institutions to work together, and uh, they have put in state statute that we will be Virginia Cooperative Extension. That is... Um, uh, we're mandated to do that. And then it says that we should work together. Um, and so even though we're expected to do that, it is the right thing to do. And so as the two institutions who serve the Commonwealth, the people of the Commonwealth, we should be working together. And uh, that is the framework from which we usually start um, our conversations. And you'll hear a little bit more about that, I think, a little bit later in our conversation. We really build our our um, relationship and the success of our relationship on four things. And the first one is about relationships and that relationships matter. Um, we were fortunate in Virginia for many years before my retirement and, and the retirement of uh, Dean Ray McKinney at Virginia State. He and I had been friends and had worked together for many, many years, both in Virginia and North Carolina. And we knew that it was important for us to have a solid relationship as leaders of the organization. But not only that, we wanted a solid relationship of the leadership team um, within the, in the organization. We also very clearly um, wanted to make sure that we had mutual respect. I mean, that is what a professional should be doing. And it's very easy at times to forget that there are differences in the two institutions and there's differences in culture and, and there's differences in resources. And so it was very important for us to have that on the table and understood and respect each other and work with each other. Janine. Um, I don't really have much to, to add to that one um, in particular, if you wanna move on to the next one. All right. All right, so common vision and common purpose. Um, so not only, you know, do we have this kind of um, common vision and common purpose as it relates to Virginia Cooperative Extension, um, we really take that a, a step further with um, how we look at what we do um, collaboratively across, across both institutions. We look at ways for us to do things together more. Um, and so that's, that's all the way down to the, to the bottom. One of the uh, interesting pieces 
about our relationship is that Virginia State University does not have um, county agents. And so it is imperative that when we are communicating and working on, you know, where do we want to go in the next five years and where do we want to go in the next 10 years that we're looking at what does that mean for specialists at both institutions and then what does that mean as it gets trickled down to the county level um, and so when we're looking at you know our common purpose we try not to uh, duplicate programs and we try to make sure that um, you know we're really making sure that the citizens of the commonwealth is our primary responsibility um, and then making sure that we were able to work together in order to accomplish those goals do you want to add to that? Nope. We'll <laughs> move on to the next one. <laughs> Shared governance. And we find this to be particularly important. And there's two, two examples of that that I'd like to bring up. One is in our development of programs. It is imperative that uh, specialists uh, from both institutions, um, program leadership from both institutions are engaged as we're developing the priority programs that will be conducted across the state. And so that we are in agreement on those. And then also how we are complementing each other in supporting those programming efforts and making sure that uh, we, we put the resources where they need to be to make that happen. It is um, the other example um, that I wanna share there it was COVID. And uh, every one of us were met with a variety of different challenges during the pandemic when um, we had to make decisions about, oh, do we close offices? Do we not close offices? Do we have in-person programming? How do we staff our offices? Um, and we made sure that even though the two universities um, might have different policies, we worked together to make sure that the message we sent to the entire Virginia Cooperative Extension system was consistent about, across both institutions. And, uh, and that, that was not easy some days, but that was our goal to make sure that we were, we had, we were in sync, it was consistent, and that we delivered one message, whether that message came from Virginia State or if it came from Virginia Tech. We also were very intent in many, many communications that those communications were shared by both institutions at the same time. It was done jointly. Um, it wasn't Ed saying one thing and, and, uh, and Dr. McKinney saying another. It was Ed and Dr. McKinney saying the same thing in the same communication. And we worked very, very hard at making sure we could do that. And that, that at times was, was challenging for us. So it was really one of understanding that we are two institutions, but we're one system. And we have to uh, figure out where we need to come together to make the, the system work. Janine? Um, I think one additional piece to this would be that, um, you know, if, if you're, if you're uh, new to this concept, you know, you might think, well, you know, how, how often are you, you all meeting to, to be able to accomplish this? And, and I would like to point out that during COVID, we met twice a week. Um, now, you know, kind of in this kind of post, you know, or endemic, you know, version of, of COVID, um, we're still meeting on a weekly basis instead of twice a week, but, um, you know, we, and when I say we, I mean the administration from both sides um, are, are consistently meeting, and then we're looking at, you know, how do we improve together? Um, we're looking at having, you um, uh, when we rolled out our new branding, you know, that was a co-branding, you know, session. We all met together collectively and made decisions together so that when we moved forward, we moved as one, even though we are two institutions. Which brings us to constant communication. <laughs> Thanks, Ed. Um, <laughs> so, um, Yes, formally, we meet every week. Um, three times a month, we meet virtually. And one time a month, we meet in person. We try to move across the state when we're meeting so that um, we are also uh, not just from an administrative standpoint, but then also going to um, our local and on the ground community level um, 
offices and making sure that they see us as a collective um, administration as well. Um, but then we're also talking during the week. I mean, we spend a lot of time saying, you know, well, hey, we've got these programs and things happening, you know, or there's 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 some moving parts here. You know, we want to make sure that you, you guys are aware as well. Um, when we do things across the state, we do things across the state collectively, whether that's, um, you know, showing up to Act Business Council or being part Part of the state fair, you know, we host, um, you know, some of the stuff for Virginia Tech, Virginia Tech uh, hosts some of the things for us as well. Um, so we like to do more shared things together, our ad communications or Mark, Marcom, depending on what institution it is. Um, we spend a lot of time, they spend a lot of time together, making sure that they're communicating on a regular basis. So we really do try from um, the top down to make sure that you know, we are all moving in, in the collective uh, direction. Ed, did you want to add to that? Uh, the only final comment I would add is that because of our mutual relationship, our respect and our common purpose, when uh, we are speaking with elected officials across the Commonwealth, uh, we support each other in that effort. It's not a competition. Um, we look at it, whatever supports either of us, supports all of us. And uh, so we uh, very often are advocating for both institutions um, for the work that's being done and, and the people involved. So we, we always say one system, two great universities. Yep. Thank you, Wendy. Well, thank you, Ed. Thank you, Janine. I, I, you know, I continue to be so impressed by this commitment to collaboration. There's so much we can learn here all the way ranging from the expectations put forth by the Commonwealth to the execution by the highest levels of leadership within the institution, all the way into the county offices. Truly impressive. So thank you so much for sharing that. We look forward to learning more. Our last example comes from a multi-state research project. And many of you know, the multi-state research projects are really the gem of the land grant system. Uh, really uh, allowing that collaboration across institutions to solve real world problems. Uh, today we have uh, members from Project S1074, Future Challenges in Food Animal Production, Seeking Solutions Through Focused Facilitation, meeting with us today. Uh, particularly the members are John Klassen, who is an Associate Professor and Director of Graduate Programs in Biological and Agricultural Engineering at North Carolina State University. John has been a member of this project for a long time and really been a leader in this project as it's moved forward and gone through many iterations. Also joining us is Dr. Rebecca Larson. Rebecca is an Associate Professor and Extension Specialist in the Nelson Institute for Environmental Studies at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, so Becky also has been with this project for quite some time and we really look forward to hearing both of your comments. Thank you, Wendy, for the introduction and thank you for um, the opportunity to talk to you today. Um, Becky and I have been working on, on this particular version of the project for, for several years. Um, it, it's a very different project from the ones you, you just heard about. Those were about uh, institutional level collaborations. The multi-state projects, you know, are across institutions, but the, the actual collaborators are individual faculty members. And, and that presents some unique opportunities and, and challenges uh, because as much as we like to think faculty are the, the kings of our own kingdom, we are very much limited by, by what our uh, deans and directors and uh, department heads will um, have us do. Next slide, please. The, the historic focus of, of this manure management, of this project has been on manure management and the common, some of the common problems associated with that are identified here, odor control, nutrient use, pollution control. And, and historically, there have always been some joint projects. Now, I want to be careful. This is a multi-state project, but this is not a project in the sense of, of significant money for specific outcomes. Um, that's the funding mechanism for the multi-states, uh, as you're aware. But there have always been collaborations among uh, across the states of individuals on actual funded projects. 
but those were facilitated by the the individual relationships and and not from what I remember those years ago were those were not um, put forward by the project itself by by this multi-state project um, some years ago probably more than 10 years ago we changed our methods with the intent of trying to work together more and we specifically looked at um, developing networks both among our uh, different disciplines. We tried to add different stakeholders. We tried to include um, as many uh, of our colleagues as we could, focused on sharing data and methodology so that we could compare results and, and compare uh, and, and integrate projects at a better time in a better way. And then brainstorming on some of the larger grand challenges. Um, I would like to ask Becky to, to speak up here and clarify some things that I may have yeah. missed. No, I, I think that's all great. I, I do want to stress a little bit on uh, the idea of bringing us together. I think faculty member in general, we are all overwhelmed with our never ending management. And it's nice with these projects to be able to bring your head up for a second and look at a bigger picture. So I think sometimes the really, it's hard to articulate sometimes some of the, the really great things about these projects. And it's really this idea that we can kind of share some vision on a bigger picture. I would say faculty members in general talk about that this is what is lacking kind of in their, um, in their kind of daily routine is the ability to stop the management for a minute and think and brainstorm and really bringing people together to kind of, um, think through where we're going, where we've been. And so I think that's a really important thing in these projects. Thank you, Becky. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, Wendy asked to identify some key attributes of, of what we think are, uh, is, are related to the success of, of our project. And, and we do consider it a, a success. Um, our annual meetings have, and. Our annual meetings have been revised so that we are more collaborating and, and talking and, and brainstorming, as Becky was just saying. We've added um, webinars, so we're not only talking to each other once a year, we're talking to each other four, four additional times a year. And we've made these learning opportunities, whether it's a, a, a new technique or introducing a, a, an entirely um, new analytical procedure, We've made this time for collaboration, for conferences, and for specific research and, and approaching particular uh, uh, proposal opportunities from a, a group and then from a, a team standpoint within the entire project for, for different research activities. And, and this actively engages all our members, especially um, new faculty that show up uh, that are hired in, in institutions related to animal agriculture, um, they're put in touch with us and we're very welcoming with them. And sometimes we'll throw them right into um, leadership roles <laughs> within the first or second year. Um, I just want to add ahead. on that if you, if you don't mind. Like, I think the, the mentorship within these is really important. I think you get people that span many generations. And I think when, when John was mentioning the, when I was a new faculty member, these were good to open up your eyes to help you realize the partnerships you need to make to get some opinions of people who have been dealing in these circumstances for a while. And then also that the young faculty members bring some new techniques, some new thoughts, some energy. Um, so I think there's some really great collaborations, particularly amongst these kinds of um, people in the different stages of their career. And I think even recently, maybe you'll see on the next slide with the, you know, combining some research and some ideas about how we formulate teams. Um, folks have even been bringing postdocs and graduate students sometimes to these now. And I think that's really critical to kind of keep this momentum of what passing on some of the information. Yeah, I, I, thank you, Becky, for saying that. I, I did want to mention that uh, a few years ago, there were, were two of us at Two of the faculty at meetings actually brought um, graduate students, and as far as I remember, it was the first time. It was it was probably ten years ago or more, and 
Honestly, the faculty forgot that the students were there. This particular meeting became uh, uh, exciting. I won't say I won't say contentious, but one thing that the, the students realized after that and shared with us um, individually is that wow, these faculty they're they're real people. They disagree. They can talk to each other. Um, but they saw us in a new light. And I think that's important for students to understand that that doesn't lessen their respect for us or, or didn't change the, uh, have any, any less um, uh, work at, change the work ethic at all when we got back to, to our institutions. But I think it's important for, for graduate students to understand that and to open their eyes as well as um, the, the faculty as Becky was saying. Uh, let's go to the next slide. We can talk about some of the um, outcomes. Um, one of those projects that I, I mentioned that the faculty from within the, the project wanted to focus on was uh, funded by the National Science Foundation in the areas of food, energy, and water, food, energy, and water systems. And the, the successful project was called Infuser. It's, it's an electronic resource facility, uh, uh, resource, electronic resources for um, other, to support other projects working in, 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 in the FUSE areas. And it was about team, teamwork and collaborations, high-performing teams. And um, you're seeing a, a, a photograph there of one of the uh, symposia that um, the Infuser held. We were doing this kind of work um, by Zoom long before COVID. Um, and in fact, our, our webinars were uh, held that way. Um, also, we even had some of our national, our annual meetings held um, remotely by, by Zoom. And, and we were well familiar with this technology before, before COVID. Um, we've had several publications that came out of these efforts, um, not just in Fuser, but, but other efforts by the projects and uh, project itself. And, in collaborations within there, and um, certainly new collaborations uh, among among colleagues. The the one thing I wanted to add is outcomes. You know, they're interesting. That you know, it's easy for us to say the publication we did or the training that we did. But really, like that publication, I would say the really benefit of it was that we we were all over the place on something that really I initially thought we were all kind of moving in the same direction. And so it was really great to have this discussion and really change my thought process on where as a, as like a nation we were headed with some of these really big uh, talking points and, and challenges that we're facing. So I think, you know, you, you might just say there's a publication and it might not really change that much, but I think the discussion and the outcomes of the way it might have changed the way we think and the, now the interactions that we have that have led away from that publication are really the critical things that are hard to document sometimes um, in these outcomes and the, and the connections that we make and how it kind of starts to impact all of our research and efforts moving forward. That's right, we certainly get, uh, and I know I have gotten um, somewhat tunnel vision with the specific challenges in North Carolina and the species of, of pigs and poultry here when uh, I talked to um, Becky in Wisconsin and some colleagues in Texas, I re remember um, that that cattle present are a big part of the situation, a big part of the issue, and present very different challenges. And and so that I think that's an important point. Speaking of challenges, we can go to the next slide. Um, we've listed some here that that in, in spite of what I call success here, we do have some, some challenges. And, and the most important, I think, is our, our never ending challenge of, of getting the, a broad, a, what I think it would be a sufficiently broad um, collection of disciplines that are actually tackling this project, this, this uh, challenge as, as a system. Um, we've historically had sometimes one, uh, maybe two economists, um, that hasn't been consistent. Um, getting new disciplines and, and new tech, uh, uh, new, especially new faculty with 
um, newer techniques or different ideas is, is difficult. And I think one of the reasons is, is, is that, that the faculty reward system is based on in our individual research and extension programs. Um, we are all expected to create nationally recognized research extension and or teaching programs as part of our job description. Our uh, department voting faculty want to see leadership uh, from each of us. And, and that, that actually, I think, in, in some ways gets in the way of collaboration. Um, I think another thing is that our, our focus, in, in spite of the, the need to look at this as a system, because our, our nutrients and feed come from every place, every, a lot of different places, or actually a few different places, and our the products go to a lot of different places. Um, our research director and extension director are often focused on what have you done for our clientele in the state? And I know that's been mentioned. Um, our faculty are fine with uh, um, national publications and collaborations, but, but sometimes the, the university is asking about uh, what we've done here. And, and the only thing I want to add, I, I know maybe we're running a little long, is that um, these, these um, teams are really driven by the people who are on them. And they're all extra workload for all of us that really isn't recognized. And the reason that we do it is because it, we're passionate and we care about the outcomes of things. And so I think remembering that um, in terms of like, what are the drivers and making sure that it doesn't become more management and bogged down by a lot of the things that happen in our own institutions and that we really can use these, this um, opportunities to really discuss and create some partnerships and collaborations without really having to have a really hardcore outcome um, is, is really important, I think. And th the ability, if I was to recommend one thing to try to help us out, maybe to provide a little more support in terms of the management of the, of the actual team so that things can have a little more continuity and flow without as much effort. Um, um, I'm just gonna end my comments there. I don't know if you have anything no. last to well, add. That, that's a good point. One, one, one example is um, uh, sharing documents. We're, we're all used to sharing documents um, through Google Drive or, or Teams. But that depends on uh, a particular faculty member at a particular university being willing to manage that. And what happens when that individual either changes the institutions, changes focus, or, or as facing some of us, re actually retires? What happens to the, the, those documents and the, that institutional management that, that comes with it? So Becky's points are, are uh, I think, um, right on, right on target. With that, I, I think we're we're past our time. Wendy, we'll um, give it back to you. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you, John. Thank you, Rebecca. Great comments. And I will point out to the participants today that this project, S1074, has been a very successful project. Within the last decade, it was the recipient of both the National uh, Multi-State Project Award as well as I think two years ago the Regional Award. And much of that is because of the partnerships across disciplines uh, that have been built through the project. But it was really great to hear from Rebecca and John some of the challenges of sustaining that transdisciplinary lens of solving these big, wicked problems. So next, we've heard from our four examples. We're going to invite our presenters to answer a couple of questions that the panel would like to put forward to the presenters. And I'd ask that maybe you raise your hand so that uh, I can see who to call on to respond to the question. The first question from the panel is, how can collaborations address differences in capacity among the partner institutions and help faculty from across the land grant system participate fully? One of the things that the panel talked about quite a bit in its deliberations was, for example, participation in these multi-state research projects. And just as Rebecca indicated, people are so busy. So what could be done to help engage participation, particularly of smaller institutions, 1890s, 1994s, 
in these multi-state research projects or people from smaller departments that have different types of responsibilities. John? On the, the, the first part of that, that, that question um, about different, about just participation, is the, the difference in how our research directors administer the hatch funds. Um, some of our directors are rather generous in, in travel funds uh, or, or really project funds. Um, some are restrictive on to, uh, as to who can access those funds as, as it can only be one person from, from the college or can it be multiple people? And, and others are working entirely off of, off of their uh, other projects that are supporting this. Um, in terms of, of, of other schools, I have the, the privilege of working here at NC State University and we have a, a, a very close relationship with, with at least our, our sister department at NCANT. They have also a biological and agricultural engineering department. Um, what I've noticed there as I try to work with them at times is, is that their focus is very different. While we're focused on the larger, uh, larger production agriculture, for instance, in my case, in animal agriculture, um, those faculty are working on smallholder farms. And, and that's very appropriate for, for them. And, and that was mentioned before, but it does not lead to... Um, a lot of collaboration. There is some collaboration, but I think it, it is, that's one thing um, that is an issue. Great, thanks, John. Alton, thanks, Ed. So I don't see any other hands up, so I'm gonna move to the other question. And the Blue Ribbon Panel, as you might know, we're trying to put together a list of recommendations for a number of stakeholders from institutional leaders, faculty, funding agencies, and even Congress to try and support improved collaboration within the land grant system. So what recommendations might you have for one of those units, institutional leaders, faculty, funding agencies, or Congress? I know some of you have addressed this in your slides, in your comments, but any other things that you want the Blue Ribbon Panel to know uh, from your experiences that we can use in our recommendations. So next, we've heard from our four examples. We're gonna invite our presenters to answer a couple of questions that the panel would like to put forward to the presenters. And I'd ask that maybe you raise your hand so that uh, I can see who to call on to respond to the question. The first question from the panel is, how can collaborations address differences in capacity among the partner institutions and help faculty from across the land grant system participate fully? One of the things that the panel talked about quite a bit in its deliberations was, for example, participation in these multi-state research projects. And just as Rebecca indicated, people are so busy. So what could be done to help engage participation, particularly of smaller institutions, 1890s, 1994s, in these multi-state research projects, or people from smaller departments that have different types of responsibilities? John? On the, the, the first part of that, that, that question um, about different, about just participation is the, the difference in how our research directors administer the hatch funds. Um, some of our directors are rather generous in, in travel funds uh, or, or really project funds. Um, some are restrictive on to, uh, as to who can access those funds is, is it can only be one person from, from the college or can it be multiple people? And, and others are working entirely off of, off of their uh, other projects that are supporting this. Um, in terms of, of, of other schools, I have the, the privilege of working here at NC State University and we have a, a, a very 
close relationship with, with at least our, our sister department at NCANT. They have also a biological and agricultural engineering department. Um, what I've noticed there is I try to work with them at times is, is that their focus is very different. While we're focused on the larger uh, larger production agriculture, for instance, in my case, in animal agriculture, um, those faculty are working on smallholder farms. And, and that's very appropriate for, for them. And, and that was mentioned before, but it does not lead to um, a lot of collaboration. There is some collaboration, but I think it, it is, that's one thing um, that is an issue. Thanks, John. Alton? My comment is very similar to John's. My thing is, anytime you're talking about like a North Carolina State and a North Carolina a and a Virginia State and Virginia Tech, uh, you basically play to your strengths. Even though the 1890s and the 1994s don't have the same uh, capacity as the 1862s, we do have unique strengths that we can add to, to any program. Uh, we have uh, intellectual capacity to add to any programs, and you play, you you uh, play to your strengths and you play to your you play to your passion. As I tell people all the time, you know, uh, the eighteen sixty the large institutions the large institutions do not have a monopoly on innovation and creativity. You know, they're at the eighteen nineties and nineteen ninety fours as well, and uh, and with Virgin and with with North Carolina State and Virginia Tech, I know they play they recognize that and play to those strengths. That Virginia Tech realizes what Virginia Tech, Virginia Tech realizes what Virginia State brings to the table. And as John said, North Carolina State realizes what AT brings to the table. And together, they make a very strong, effective program that improves the quality of life of all the residents of the people that we serve. Play to the strengths. Thanks, Alton. Uh, Rebecca. Uh, I just wanted to add that I think sometimes. Um, um, as faculty members, we could have greater participation if one, there was more um, attention brought to these collaborations in general. So as a faculty member, I never knew about them and had to get by word of mouth. There was certainly no one from above letting us know that this existed or how to navigate it by any means. So it was all individuals. And I think even on S1074, we reach out to people and maybe there we need to rethink some of the way these things are kind of structured and funded, because even though you know the institutions have some of the money, they have a lot of other priorities. And so if we think these things, these collaborations are important enough, maybe the funds should be more structured that way so that you know there's money for this, people who want to join, it might be a little more straightforward on how that how the partnerships could come together. Great. Thanks, Rebecca. Janine. Um, I would say two things. So one is that we look at things from an issue based perspective, which then allows for people to play to their key strengths. Um, and then the second piece would be that you have to bring the players to the table at the beginning. A lot of the, the uh, grants and stuff that I see they've wrote, they've asked somebody to come in at the, the very tail end, they've already put the whole project together, and then they just want the, this other institution just to add to, to the collaborative space, but not really respecting the strengths and the skills at those other institutions. And so I would say, you know, maybe, um, I know Extension has a tendency to do this a little bit more because we, we do try to be, um, you know, one system anyway, but allowing for spaces for us to be able to um, have these conversations around these issues with, with the different folks from the different institutions, because by having those opportunities to have those discussions, then you find partners around those issues that, that all, you know, are interested in the same issues. And then you find those partners that actually want to be able to work and collaborate together. Great. Thank you, Janine. Steve? Thank you, Wendy. Just to reinforce some of the comments that Alton and others have made it, first of all, you need to know each other uh, and you need to know each other's strengths and weaknesses. The other piece is that most oftentimes the re once, once there's a collaboration that's identified and it's, and, and it, it's recognized, for example, Miles in Michigan is now recognized. 
And what we see is a lot of faculty members, especially from the 1862 partner, they see this platform and they recognize that as an incredible opportunity to strengthen proposals and increase the likelihood that proposals might be funded. And that's a good thing. But oftentimes at the, at the 1994s and the 1890s, per, perhaps, it's not necessarily faculty members who are facilitating the land grant work. It, it's folks who are hired specifically to carry out the land grant mission of the institution. We don't have the luxury of, of dozens and dozens and dozens of faculty members who could potentially devote time to research or extension projects. And, and how do the 1862 faculty members know this? Well, they, they participate in the relationship building. They, they participate in opportunities that we as MILES provide for each institution to get to know each other and what the strengths and weaknesses are. And we've also discussed recently some sort of a screening tool or mechanism whereby all these requests that are now coming to MILES, and there are plenty of them uh, on a weekly basis, how do we somehow screen those so that we identify appropriate opportunities for further collaborations and weed the ones out that um, look like they're going to lead to some of the shortcomings that have already been identified? Uh, and, and, and how do we do that? And, and, and as we get to know one another, it becomes easier for each of us to say, no, I don't think we can do that. I don't think that's something that we can participate in. That's not we, we don't have the capacity or that's not something that our community is interested in or uh, it's just not part of our mission. So, so much of that is involved in relationship building and getting to know one another. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Emily. I oh, appreciate it, Wendy. And uh, yeah, I appreciate all of your comments thus far. I, I fully support and echo, echo what our panelists have shared today. To add on though, I would, Coming from an 1862 perspective and engaging in this work with tribal nations, tribal communities, and colleges, um, nations including my own, you know, it's building that capacity also internally at 1862s. And what I mean by capacity is how are we able to have conversations with current staff or working with our partners at tribal colleges and tribal nations to, to leverage the resources and funds that we as 1862s have access to, to respond to those needs, to develop positions that are co-shared, co-created uh, with our partners. And uh, again, internally, it's creating those professional development opportunities to address the systems, the systems that may not have always been there to support staff who do this work. You know, it's addressing the, um, how do I, uh, it's addressing the, the structures uh, to support an individual who, who has been asked to work with tribal nations. You know, not often have our systems been created for individuals to do that work. You know, where do you go when uh, you run into community members beyond the tribes who may not uh, understand nor appreciate the work that you're doing with tribes? You know, questioning why you're funded, questioning, uh, you know, why is extension moving in this, this uh, moving forward in this effort. So how can we build uh, a response system internally to build capacity, work with our partners to build staffing plans, uh, make sure those staffing plans reflect the needs of the communities we're serving, but also come from a place of humility and authenticity to know that our systems are not perfect, that they need tweaking, they uh, continue to address that power dynamic, if you will. So. I think those conversations in my institution I'm affiliated with has contributed um, to building this awesome effort. And I mean awesome every sense of the word um, of miles, but also mm, creating some level, I won't say per se trust and with all tribal nations, but at least have an understanding of who we are, what we do, and how we are able to approach this partnership in a humble way by saying, we're not here with all the answers. We're not here to do this to you. However, we're here when you're ready. We are working to address those issues as you're comfortable with coming forward. Hope that made sense. 
It did. Thanks, Emily. Great message. Ed. Yeah, just briefly, in, in my experience, one of the things that causes collaborations to collapse is that we forget to, we forget the end goal. Uh, we forget our mission and we get wrapped up in our structures and, and uh, sometimes egos and sometimes who's going to get credit and, and we got to come back and say, okay, what is it we're trying to do and why are we trying to do that? And who are we trying to serve? And, and that, that is really important to just remind ourselves of that on a regular basis. Thanks, Ed. So I don't see any other hands up. So I'm gonna to move to the other question. And the Blue Ribbon panel, as you might know, we're trying to put together a list of recommendations for a number of stakeholders from institutional leaders, faculty, funding agencies, and even Congress to try and support improved collaboration within the land grant system. So what recommendations might you have for one of those units, institutional leaders, faculty, funding agencies, or Congress? I know some of you have addressed this in your slides, in your comments, but any other things that you want the Blue Ribbon panel to know uh, from your experiences that we can use in our recommendations? John? I, I have two things that I would, I would recommend. Um, one directly related to your, your question, would be to find ways to uh, encourage and reward collaboration in general, even on, on our own campuses. If that can be built into promotion and tenure systems, then, then faculty will be more likely to do that. That's what faculty respond to, that and raises. Um, the other is, is related, um, somewhat and I think it, it, it changes the focus of, of what the faculty do and it's something I will say as often as, as people will let me and since you're letting me I'm going to say it now you may have heard this Wendy but I think our focus should be on graduate education rather than outstanding outstanding graduate education programs rather than outstanding research and extension programs. I think the outcomes will be the same. We will get the research done. We will develop good research, great research programs. But with the focus on students, I think we will get better outcomes for, for them, for the students, and for the future. Thanks, John. Rebecca. Um, I think the one thing that I would like to say is when people are planning things and they want to strengthen something like state collaborations, you know, you vet a bunch of information and then you make up like a plan of action or a direction, remembering that there's a lot of diversity going here on here, right, and a lot of different ways that we all have to operate in our systems. So there might be an end goal, but maybe setting up the structure so there's three ways to get to it or four ways, you know, as many as you can think of instead of one would help, I think, a lot of people be able to use different tools that they might have to, to engage their membership and others to participate. Thank you. Uh, Moses. Thank you. I, uh, just speaking to, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, speaking to uh, something that I did mention during uh, our presentation, but the idea of, of having enabling structures or that enabling environment that is supportive of collaborations. And in our example, uh, the idea of even having an 1890 universities foundation that helps cut across uh, the red tape of bureaucracies uh, within certain processes of setting up these kinds of collaborative partnerships, I think would be helpful. And so uh, being able to support such structures uh, would really uh, 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 result in uh, the establishment of unsustaining of collaborations. 
uh, because I think that is a major stumbling block, uh, just the fact that our institutions are so different uh, sometimes in terms of our processes. Thanks, Moses. Open. Part of my response is having a brain freeze, but I'm sure you can figure it out. One of the things I would do is, with respect to uh, Janine and Ed's presentation, just take that second slide. That second slide about as well collaboration would be a definite one to put in the the uh, present. I get suggestions from the, the national academies. Also, ideal of active listening is is critically important. The thing that the uh, also what Janine also mentioned was uh, involving partners from the very beginning, not at the end. And the one the thing I'm having a, a brain freeze on, there was a book I read about the growth mindset. And I forgot the author, but I can send it to you, Wendy. It's about having a growth mindset as you go through these collaborations. That's an excellent book. It's an excellent piece of work. I think everybody in higher education ought to read it. It's called The Growth Mindset. Great. Thanks for that. We'll look up that book for sure. <laughs> Emily. One idea that uh, myself and a team of uh, faculty and um, previous Native students on campus wrote was a reciprocal research guide. And I can share the link if you'd like. But within this guide, it offers, uh, the official title is Reciprocal Research, a guidebook to centering community and partnerships with indigenous nations. And uh, we hoped individuals would use this as a larger effort for planning for and reflecting on research partnerships. So you're able to use it individually in a community uh, graduate level course, but this helps to walk through, uh, if you will, as an example, um, your intention and motivation to engage in research with indigenous nations. What has propelled you to go down that road, be it extension, be it faculty. Uh, and so we hope that this would uh, support individuals aspiring to engage in research. Uh, there's also five scenarios included uh, for you to work through. They're all based on different topics such as environmental, gardening and food, uh, supporting change, uh, tribal sovereignty and research. So there's a couple of different examples in there, but I encourage um, individuals who, who are wanting to go down, go down this road of research with indigenous communities to do, to engage in that self-reflection, your, um, if you will, doing your own work, right, to, to engage with these particular communities. And is that something you'd like for me to share? I, I could. If you could put a link in the question, that would be great. Sure. And Steve and Emily, I don't know if you're monitoring the Q&A, but there, there are some questions in there specifically that oh. I don't think we have time for you to respond to today, but if you could grab them and the person submitting them and uh, maybe respond offline to them, I, I think they'd appreciate that. Thanks, Wendy. So we are winding down. Any last comments on that last question from the Blue Ribbon panel that anyone wants to share? Okay, I don't see any hands. So I'm gonna just say a, a couple of concluding words, turn it over to my colleagues, Moses and Steve, if they wanna add anything and then we'll toss it back to uh, our chair, Catherine, for any final remarks. Uh, so I, I do want to thank everybody for finding the time to come and serve as a panelist, participate and listen, and really help us all move forward in trying to strengthen our collaborations across the land grant system. This has been just a wonderful experience for me to be part of the Blue Ribbon panel, but really to hear from all of you today uh, so that I can take this in my own learning uh, and try and improve. Um, Thank you so much. I know it's been a lot of time putting things together and, and making time on your calendars for this, but on behalf of the panel, we really appreciate it. Uh, Steve, Moses, anything you'd like to add? Uh, no, I'd just like to echo your remarks and uh, uh, just give my thanks. Uh, th thank you, Wendy. Just that there are examples that seem to be working, and I think that recommendations need to reflect what, what is working well and and also that 
the focus can't always be on um, how do we get big grants? The, the focus has to be on how do we work collectively together, whether it's within a state or a multi-state to better impact the quality of lives of the people whom we're expected to serve. And I, I know sometimes that's difficult to, to grasp, especially you know, from a, a, a big time research perspective, but um, if we're going to bring the smaller institutions along effectively and meaningfully, the focus has to be on how do we better serve the people whom our, our mission dictates that we serve. Um, and there's no doubt that collectively we can do that better than we can individually. Even with the, even with the disparities in capacity, we've been able to work around that. We, we've been able to impact that. Um, once we get to know one another, we can work together to, to somehow make, make it work, even with the, the capacity disparities. Not that we like those disparities, do we? But we can certainly work, work around them and, and work together within those realities. Thank you. Thanks for that, Steve. Uh, Catherine, anything you want to say to close this out? Uh, yes, thank you, Wendy, and, and again, a thank you to everyone who participated uh, in the, the presentations today and in this session. What I'd like to do is a, a last call for any Blue Ribbon Panel Committee members uh, for comments or questions uh, that you might have before we uh, end this particular session today. So if anyone else from the committee has comments or questions that they would like to make, uh, this would be a really great time uh, to, to do that. Uh, meanwhile, again, uh, these were four terrific presentations, I think very deep and meaningful ideas with regard to why we form partnerships, the value of forming partnerships and some really important ideas about why some partnerships and collaborations work, uh, why some others uh, fall apart, uh, and some terrific insight into uh, some of the characteristics of those that have had long standing success. And so I'm so grateful for that. Well, um, seeing no uh, committee members uh, raising their hands and speaking up. So at this point, uh, I will thank everyone again for participating and uh, I'm very grateful for your time today. So thank you all. <laughs>